Okay, guys, so hopefully you just finished watching The Secrets of the Parthenon by um, Nova. If you haven't done that already, make sure to do that before watching this lecture um, so that you sort of have context to what I'm going to sort of discuss now um, revolving around the Parthenon and sort of Greek culture and history as well. And I'm going to kind of go through these in sections um, there's about six of them, and kind of discuss some of these sort of points that this um, documentary kind of hits on. So the first is cultural political context of Athens, who is Pericles, um, and the role of the Persians, and sort of what ends up happening with the building of the Acropolis and the Parthenon. So when we're looking at sort of ancient Greek history, we kind of touched on some of this, um, in our discussion of the human figure, including sort of classical period and severe style, as well as Hellenistic, um, and some archaic as well, with some focus on um, some sort of early Greek sculpture. But when we are discussing sort of this time period of when the building of the Parthenon occurs and when Pericles is involved, um, in sort of the rebuilding of the Acropolis, we're in the classical period. Um, we'll be mostly focusing in the high classical period, um, but we will be kind of moving throughout this. So 480 to 323 BC. And like I said, we kind of went over some of this with um, a discussion of classical sculpture um, with some of the works that we looked at from three weeks now ago, I believe. Seems like forever ago. So the classical period, like I said, is 480 to 323, and I'm going to first sort of give an overview of the early classical period, um, which goes till 450. And they're marked by sort of two specific events, and we're going to talk about them as well, specifically um, the defeat of the Persians in 480 BCE. Um, but it also, the classical period ends with the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE. So, warfare begins in 490 with revolts against Persia, who are trying to take over many of the cities uh, in ancient Greece. And in 490 BCE, there's a Greek town of Marathon that drives out the Persians. And in 480, the Persians invade and sack the city of Athens. And um, eventually, the Athenians revolt with Sparta and win back control, um, which then leads to the rebuilding um, system by Pericles. As a sort of side note in the history um, of sort of the word and idea of a marathon, um, marathons are named because a man ran 26 miles to tell the victory of Marathon um, to the Athens and kind of falls over from exhaustion and dies. And this is where you get this 26 miles um, to run for a marathon, which is weird. Um, and this is a weird painting um, here of that event. Um, I don't know. It's quite um, dramatic. This reminds me of like, what are those? Like, why are you naked? Um, but that is an image there of a marathon. Or the story of the marathon, that is. So when the Persians invade um, Athens in 480 BC, they completely sort of demolish the Acropolis. And so anything that we know of the Acropolis, of the building of it by Pericles, is after 480 BCE because the Persians literally lay waste to the entire city um, center here by destroying the temples, by destroying sculptures, just completely sort of ransacked by the Persians. And so this is a, I'll show you some actual images of this as well, but um, this is kind of an image that gives you a sense that um, they're building on top of these old structures of the temple. And so when these buildings were destroyed, they literally just went and kind of rebuilt the new buildings right on top, which is actually pretty sort of normal um, in rebuilding buildings, um, even up through the Renaissance. So they literally have sort of the um, destruction of sculptures. According to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, when Persians sacked Athens, they destroyed or damaged many sculptures, including the now famous calf bear. Athenians buried many of these sculptures in a pit, pit, which were not uncovered until the 19th century. So this included even them going through the Acrop Acropolis and beheading sculptures. Um, 
to sort of do the most destruction they possibly could to Greek culture at the time. This is another famous image here where you can see the remains of the first sort of temples in um, the Acropolis to Athena that are being reincorporated into the ancient building. So these column drums being used as part of the wall structure here um, would have been part of the original uh, buildings that were destroyed by the Persians. And here's some images of that as well with the Parthenon. You have the old Parthenon foundation as well as some rebuilding here. So they tried to utilize as many of the materials as they could to kind of rebuild on top of to create the Acropolis as sort of um, it was known then and now as well. So in this early classical period, the Greeks feel this sort of great identity and independence after defeating the Persians. They feel sort of powerful and that they've kind of taken back their city. And so this is really considered the early classical period when they've taken back power um, from the Persians and they're going to work to rebuild their city. So this is known as the classical period, as we discussed in um, sort of our look at the human figure. And classical comes from the idea of the highest rank or standard of excellence. Greek art is going to try to create ideal images based on mathematical proportions. Roman art is going to try to copy this like we discussed. And then some elements you might remember are um, Humanism, rationalism, and idealism. Man is the measure of all things. And grounded in their art and close observation of nature, Philoso philosophers Sophocles, Plato, and Aristotle as well. So when they move into the high classical period, we have the um, rebuilding of the Acropolis and this system created by Pericles, who's a really famous dynamic Greek ruler from 462 to 429, and is really considered kind of the golden age for Greeks, and turning the Acropolis into the center of religious and political life, um, and the Acropolis coming from part of the city on top of the hill. And Pericles takes on this massive sort of ambitious building project. Um, then this is around the time that Polyclitus is working on his Jolly Forest. Um, and so he's working to kind of reconstruct the Acropolis and make it kind of this monument to the power of the Greek state. And he asked his artist and friend Phidias to help rebuild to boost morale, and they bring about 22,000 tons of marble from 10 miles away, um, which is kind of discussed ever so briefly in the Nova documentary. And during this time, Pericles is raising this money through the Delian League, um, and it's supposed to be about kind of raising money for the Acropolis and... Um, promoting the Greek state at large and is kind of pushing this ideal of like democracy and that the people have power again in their city. Um, but what kind of ended up happening um, is that while the people thought they were kind of donating to the rebuilding of the city at large, it all kind of went to this rebuilding of the Acropolis. And this is kind of massive, um, artistic development that didn't necessarily need to happen at that time. And so Pericles is kind of discussed as this great leader, but there is this element that could, he could have been kind of tyrannical. Um, there, here's a quote, uh, thus the Periclean building program was not the glorious fruit of Athenian democracy as commonly thought, but the byproduct of tyranny and abuse of power. So Pericles kind of used the Delian League and the raising of funds to promote this very particular idea of rebuilding of the Acropolis, which may or may not have been sort of what everyone in the city of Greece wanted, right? So again, not kind of like a true democracy, which is like, oh, we don't know what that's like at all um, in the United States. So we are going to look at a couple of different buildings here, um, obviously most exclusively the Parthenon, um, but this is kind of a 
artistic rendering of the Acropolis on Athens um, with the Parthenon, um, the Propylia, which is the entrance gate here, the picture gallery, Temple of Athena Nike, and then the Erechtheon in the back here. Um, and this is what it looks today. So the um, this is the front here where the Propylia um, and the Temple of Athena Nike are up in front here. So I'm just going to go through these other buildings here ever so briefly. Um, the Propylia is this gatehouse into the Acropolis. It's basically the entranceway up into the Acropolis, um, kind of stands as this gateway into um, the kind of area as area at large. I don't know what I was going to say. And it also helped to kind of become a gallery for housing paintings, paintings for public view, as well as holding dinners, um, etc. That next structure here that is next to the Propylia, um, right here, this tiny little temple, um, as you can see here, um, is the Temple of Athena Nike. Um, and this temple um, was to greet visitors and it commemorated the victory over the Persians. Um, and on this particular temple, uh, it had a set of relief sculptures that represented the Battle of Marathon and this victory over the Persians. So. Um, it became sort of this monument to that defeat um, as you entered into the Acropolis here. It's also really interesting because this temple um, has a couple of sets of different columns. So in the um, front and back, it has sort of um, ionic columns. And the last building we're going to discuss um, before diving into the Parthenon is the Erechtheon, um, which is kind of um, off to the side of the Parthenon, so on sort of the center area of the Acropolis. Um, and it's kind of been built and rebuilt, and so it has this kind of interesting um, use of levels. You kind of have like all the different parts of it on different levels here. Um, but I'm going to have a... A Khan Academy video kind of explain um, this building as a whole and kind of the competition here um, that went on to sort of create the building um, that we know of here in the other the building of the Erechtheon. At the top of the Acropolis in Athens, adjacent to the Parthenon, the largest building, is a small, complex, and elegant building called the Erechtheum. This is an Ionic temple, in contrast to the Parthenon, which is largely Doric. And we notice the Ionic features immediately. The columns are more slender. There's a decorative detail and fineness, and the scroll shapes that we associate with the Ionic order in the capitals. We're approaching the Erechtheum from the east side, and from this angle, the the building looks fairly traditional. We see six columns, the rightmost of which is a reconstruction. Now originally, all the Ionic columns on this temple were even more decorative. There was glass inlaid, there was gold around the bases and in the capitals. It must have been a glorious sight. We could refer to this building not as the Erechtheum, but instead as the temple to Athena Polias, that is, Athena as the protector goddess of the city of Athens. On this east end was a room that held the ancient statue of Athena that was said to have dropped from the heavens and it was made of olive wood. It was very simple. It was nothing like the statue just across the way sculpted by Phidias. So you have this real contrast because with the Erechtheum we have this highly decorative building that's very elegant but which housed a very severe and plain statue of Athena but across the way in the severe Doric was... temple of the Parthenon we had a enormous high 
highly decorative sculpture of Athena. If you were to enter into the east side, you would walk into a relatively shallow cella, this room that would have been the shrine to this olive wood sculpture of Athena. But this is a much more complicated building than that. Right, because normally in a Greek temple, you expect to see symmetry. In this case, the earth drops down, and the building itself is sandwiched into a very tight space between the foundation of the old temple to Athena that the Persians had destroyed and the sheer cliff at the edge of the Acropolis. And yet the architect invented a very elegant solution. Instead of a temple that has six columns on both the east and the west, what the architect has done is to swing the back colonnade around to the north. If we walk down a set of stairs that brings us to an area dedicated to Zeus and to the great north porch. So we've just walked down a narrow, steep flight of stairs, but originally there was a broad staircase that brought us down to a precinct associated with Zeus. He was the divine judge of a contest between a god and a goddess to see who could be the patron of the city of Athens. And in a contest judged by the earthly king Erechtheon, the mythic figure, hence the name of this temple, the Erechtheum, Erechtheus asked each god to offer a gift to the people of Athens, and he would be the earthly judge. Athena offers an olive tree, a symbol of peace, of fertility, and just here on the west side was the location of that tree offered by Athena. In fact, the modern Athenians have replanted that tree in that spot. And for Poseidon's part, he took his trident and struck a rock, and from it came a spring of salt water. He is the ruler of the seas. In fact, if you look at the north porch of the Erechtheum, you can see that in the roof, there's a hole, there's a window, and according to tradition, this is where his trident came down from the sky and struck the bedrock from which the spring of salt water came and if you look at the base of the porch you can see that there's some missing stone which allows you to see the actual mark in the bedrock so this temple the erechtheum was a complicated place it had to hold not only the sculpture to athena but also these pre-existing shrines okay so hopefully you sort of gather from the smart history video um slash khan academy sort of the basis of this structure the erechtheon um, and obviously Athena becomes the sort of patron goddess of um, Athens, right? Athens, Athena. Um, and so this is kind of the place for that competition between Poseidon and Athena to kind of develop Athena as the um, patron goddess of uh, the city as a whole. So I kind of gave you a overall plan here of um, where some of those locations of the objects are um, as discussed in that video as well. Something else that the video kind of goes on to discuss, um, which is important about the Erechtheon, and I thought I would just talk about it here since I know their highfalutin voices are a little um, weird to listen to. There are these caryatids um, that also stand in the Erechtheon, which are really great and interesting because here you have um, Greek sculpture and creating kind of going to this um, really sort of interesting level of utilizing sculptures of bodies as columns. And so here you have sort of women um, being made into sort of column drums, um, which is really fantastical use of sort of art and classical sculpture to kind of utilize them as the structure for these buildings, um, like the Erechtheon. So we can see that here exemplified on the Acropolis. Okay, we are moving on to the Parthenon, also known as the Temple, the Temple of Athena Parthenos, um, which is the main structure discussed, obviously, in the secrets of the Parthenon. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about these elements of the sculptural program by Thydeus, um, which kind of lead into a lot of what we'll be discussing when we come back from spring break. The temple of um, Athena Parthenos, or the Parthenon, really kind of represents three different ideas, which is the triumph of the democratic Greek city-states over imperial Persia, the preeminence of Athens thanks to the favor of Athena, and the triumph of enlightened Greek civilization over despotism and barbarism, which very much kind of links up into their defeat of um, Persia. But we're going to see all of these in the artistic um, elements of the Parthenon itself.
So Phineas is the artist behind sort of the development of all of the different types um, of sculptural programs on the Parthenon. And there's sort of three set ones here, um, which we will talk about all of them in the pediments and the friezes and the metopes, as well as um, this sculpture here um, of Athena that would have been at the center of the Parthenon as well. This is what the temple looks like structurally. Um, I showed this briefly here a couple of times now, but if you hopefully get a sense, these are kind of the columns um, that go around the exterior and then interior. Um, and then you can sort of get a sense of the walls. And this helps because it gives you um, what the artistic um, metopes are around each structure, like here and here. And I'll talk about what a metope is in a minute. Um, and as well as the pediments. So when you look at, at sort of a sculptural layout of the temple, um, it helps you to kind of get an overview of what's going on in the Parthenon. Um, or any sort of Greek building as well. Now the center area is called the Sella or Naus. It's the temple core, um, which often held a cold statue of a deity or goddess. Um, and of course, in this case, that of Athena Parthenos, which was by Phidias. Um, and this um, sculpture no longer exists. It was destroyed. Um, and so we only have kind of a sense of what it would have looked like from sort of recreations. Um, it was considered one of the most expensive sculptures um, ever made. It was gold and ivory and 38 feet tall. And we have a kind of recreation of it, ironically, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, they have their own Parthenon, which I will talk about here in a minute. Um, but this is the replica of what we believe she would have looked like here um, on the left in some sort of um, up close elements as well. And it represents her here. She is holding Athena Nike in her right hand, um, which is the personification of victory, as you might know from um, the Nike sculpture at the Louvre, which is very famous. And there are numerous sort of sculptural elements discussing the defeat of the Persians, as well as this kind of defeat over barbarism and despotism, like I mentioned. So um, one of them is on the sandals here of Athena. Um, you have the uh, centauromachy, which I know is quite the word, uh, but it is a um, defeat of centaurs <clears throat> uh, featured on her sandals. And on the shield itself, we have the Greeks and Amazons fighting one another, which is the Amaz Amazon Maki. I'm really bad at these words as well. Um, which is a story about how Theseus drove out the Amazons from Athens. Um, it also has a reference to Medusa with snakes. And on the center of the... Um, shield as well, which I don't have an image of here, is um, the Gigantomachy, which is a triumph over giants, uh, which references chaos and civilization over barbarism again. So there are all these different sculptural elements that are also repeated on the Parthenon, which are kind of just about um, defeating right evil, right? Defeating barbarism, despotism, all these things that the Greeks um, say that they're against in the sculptural programs um, on Athena as well as the building itself. And yes, the for some reason, Nashville, Tennessee has this replica of the Parthenon, which is really interesting. It was created as um, part of a um, centennial event, um, which is really random. Um, and the statue was kind of unveiled in 1990 as part of the recreate, recreation of the Parthenon. Um, this is an advertising for that from 1897. So if you're ever in Nashville, Tennessee. So 
So here's some of those words. I'm using the Centauromachy, um, as well as Gigantomachy, uh, Pantheatic Procession, we're going to talk about a little bit, and Amazon, Amazon McKee. There's too many uh, vowels. So there are a series of different types of um, metope series that are on the exterior as well as the interior, being the Panthe Panthenaic Procession, um, the Sack of Troy, Birth of Athena, um, Centaur Omaki, Amazon Omaki, Contest Between Athena and Poseidon, um, etc. So I'm going to kind of lay them out for you here ever so briefly so that you kind of get a sense of them because they're important to our conversation about um, the Parthenon when we come back from break. So we're going to first talk about the pediment. The pediment is this triangular portion of the temple right here, um, which is on both sides of this temple and decorated on both sides. So you can kind of see that structure here. On the west pediment, there is the competition between Athena and Poseidon, as was discussed in the Erechtheon video from Khan Academy. Um, we don't have a lot of this remaining sculpture. Um, we have kind of bits and pieces of it, and so I've um, given you kind of recreations of it here that kind of help you visualize sort of what it would have looked like and also sort of what art historians uh, believe it would have looked like as well. Um, but these are some existing pieces of the sculpture here, um, which I want to say come from um, the end here, um, as well as sort of the heads of the horses, obviously. So you can see some of that great sculptural proportion um, and sort of body representation as we talked about during the human figure. And you see they've kind of structured it in the British Museum, so you can see kind of the move up the um, pediment structure. The next um, structure on the East Pediment is the Birth of Athena, um, as she is the patron goddess of Athens. And this uh, features her birth um, from Zeus, who is here on her uh, right or left. A little better imagery here and there are a couple different sort of stories about the birth of Athena um, she doesn't have a mother she comes straight from Zeus um, which is a different story because um, typically Zeus is out having sort of um, interesting marital relationships with random women um, but anyway in this story um, Zeus has a headache of sorts and Athena is born out of his head, uh, fully born, uh, fully as a woman in armor, um, and sort of becomes his most favorite daughter, um, as you can imagine why that would be. And um, that this is sort of the story of her birth here on the pediment. And these are the portions of the sculpture system we're going to be looking at. They're sort of the most well-preserved um, in sort of sculptural form, um, which are um, some of the classical figures. And again, you can see this really intense use of drapery and power that we kind of talked about in our discussion of um, the human figure and the way that the Greeks are kind of representing the human body and form at this time. And you can imagine that Phidias is kind of a master of his craft and the way that he's creating this sculptural program. So I'm going to give you a couple of close-ups here so you can see this as well. And the drapery feels very similar to um, some of the other sculptural systems we've talked about as well. Hopefully you remember sort of from defining beauty um, we looked at these goddesses here on the right, um, which are here, again, um, in the sort of use of 
the extensive use of drapery and the way that drapery is represented, right? It kind of talked about this way that Phidias is representing drapery um, to the extent that the bodies are almost naked, right? The kind of wetness and the way that the drapery kind of sticks to the body and the form, right? To give these sculptures um, sort of a lifelike nature. Okay, so moving off of the um, pediments, we're going to be looking at um, the metos and triglyphs that are around um, the exterior of the Parthenon as well. Um, and to give you kind of a better idea of what that looks like again, so this again is the pediment. Um, we're going to be looking at the frieze here shortly, but right now we're going to be looking at the metopes and triglyphs, and they're usually little sort of story panels um, that move throughout the temple here. And I'll be going over some parts of temple structure as well. Um, but this is a metope and the triglyph is in between here to kind of separate the panes um, of the story. So the first one is similarly to on um, the statue of Athena Parthenos is centaurs um, and the centaurs battling the um, lap lapiths, um, which is a combat um, including the these including Theseus of Athens as I sort of previously discussed with um, the shield of Athena Parthenos and you can kind of see the intense way that the Greeks are representing the figure and the form of the bodies um, in kind of the musculature and this really sort of high classical period that we're in in this layer of naturalism um, and also sort of composition and that they're using this very high relief and that the bodies almost seem like they're coming off the pieces of marble um, and almost like they're not even attached to it, right? That they're almost like structures unto themselves. Um, and so they utilize these great pieces of composition to depict this idea of these centaurs and battling the centaurs and thinking about sort of um, democracy and barbarism as well. So we have this great turning of bodies and manipulation of muscular forms, um, as well as the great use of drapery and movement that is naturalistic, but also with ideal bodies. Um, but they're also kind of fluid motion and these powerful scenes um, of a battle, right, in these kind of squares to tell the story, right? And you can imagine they're way up on a temple, so you have to be able to see them and kind of interpret them um, on their own, right, and sort of very far away from you. Here you have one where a centaur is even holding this sort of panther skin and you can see kind of the drapery of that as well as the lapith who's kind of fallen um, and has kind of the drapery of the fabric here as well. So they're, they're really in these kind of intense dynamic pieces. And even like having this simple layer of kind of like doing this very low relief of fabric um, really adds to kind of the value of the pieces. In this one, we have a centaur kind of running off with a maiden, um, which is a different sort of um, image than the other ones. And some of them you can really see sort of the technical skill that the Greeks have in kind of creating this X composition in which you have um, the centaur and the lapith battling and this kind of cross composition that's created through their bodies, right? That's kind of naturalistic, but also not um, in sort of the twirling and fighting off um, of uh, the centaurs between the lapiths. And... There are also kind of representations of this in color as well. So here's kind of a recreation on the left. Um, again, remember that Greek art is often painted and in color. And so it's going to look a little different than we think it does. Um, so this is kind of a representation of that and what it would have looked like on the Parthenon itself. And the documentary kind of mentions it because they state like, oh, well, they could do a full restoration of um, the Parthenon and kind of repaint it. Um, but they just sort of wanted to put together what they had to kind of um, put the pieces back together, and, but not sort of influence it in any sort of other capacity like painting, um, etc. And the next piece is the frieze. And the frieze is on the interior of the building. So the secondary structure, um, let me get that 
uh, diagram back up again. So it'll be on, these are the first initial walls, um, and then on this secondary set of walls here. And in this series, I know this image is a little blurry, um, but we have a the Panthenaic Festival of the Procession of the Athena um, sculpture. So that little wooden sculpture that would have been housed in the Erechtheon is taken out, and there is a procession about the city in which they're sort of celebrating Athena um, and moving about um, the city. And it occurred every four years. Um, and the procession kind of moves all throughout the interior of the Parthenon in this sort of decoration. And this is a little lower relief um, than the metopes, as you can see, they're kind of flatter. Um, but it has this great intense movement, it's 520 feet long, um, and the Greeks place themselves in conjunction with uh, gods, so there's some, some gods featured in the procession as well, and so it's kind of making them equally as worthy in some respect to um, the gods. The Greeks kind of doing that with an element of, right, of humanism and these other elements we've talked about as well. I also wanted to do the briefest sort of overview of um, the orders of Greek architecture, just because this is kind of important. Um, it maybe would have been helpful more at the sort of beginning discussion of this. Um, I feel sort of in retrospect, but um, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian um, sculpt the columns. I'm sorry. Um, and I know this is a little blurry. I'm going to give you the worksheet that this comes from. Um, but this is kind of an overview of the Doric and Ionic orders, which are sort of the first two um, monumental Greek architecture uh, column structures and um, decorations of the temples. So the first being the Doric order, um, which is considered sort of the masculine version, which is a little weird, but... Um, we like to do that for some reason in art history. Um, the less frilly and strong, um, it's very so much focused on weight bearing and um, you have the tapering up to the capital. So it starts out sort of larger at the bottom and gets smaller at the top um, with the capital here, which is quite flat in general. Um, and again, we have metopes and triglyphs sort of early and um, the stylobate and the stairbate, um, which are kind of um, which the column kind of goes directly on here. So we saw an example of this with the um, Palace of Knossos. We then have the Ionic Order, which is kind of more feminine and frilly. Um, there is a base to give it transition, which is different from Doric. Um, it has flutes and they are kind of more tightly packed than the Doric, so they have their bigger flutes here, um, which are the sort of, I don't know, semicircular shapes on the columns to give it sort of um, value. So those are more tightly packed in the Ionic order, and then the volute here um, and the capital um, being sort of decorative, organic, and scroll-like, so versus having that kind of cushion-like um, capital, we have this one that's a sort of volute shape. Nionic order often has a frieze versus metopes and triglyphs with the pediment, um, and so you can see the Parthenon kind of incorporates the um, Doric with the Ionic in doing a frieze on the interior with metopes and triglyphs on the exterior. Which I just said. And then the final, of course, is the Corinthian. And as you can see, it just sort of gets more decorative um, in a lot of senses. And you have kind of a mixing, um, but mostly the utilization of a frieze in the Corinthian order versus metopes and triglyphs. Um, and the capital usually having um, some sort of decorative um, leaf or foliage um, in it. So sort of much more elaborate and decorative than some of the other um, columns.
Some of the final really interesting elements that the documentary touches on are optical illusions and technological innovation. Um, it's kind of intense to see the way that they're doing this restoration and kind of trying to restore this structure, right? Taking, um, we're up to like 35, 36 years now. And this discussion of why this has been sort of so difficult and each piece kind of being this puzzle. Um, and they talk about how it took five years to do 500 pieces, right? And they have, they have seven, 700,000 to do or 70,000 to do. So even to the fact that their computer systems can't even really pick up um, on how sort of um, delicate these columns have to kind of go back together, right? They kind of have to do it by eye, which seems like insane. Um, but they've sort of done this great work at kind of restructuring this building um, and spent sort of hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. And one of the big reasons, of course, that it is so um, sort of difficult to put back together is because of the entesis in the building. Um, and this is the word that they used in the documentary, um, which is that they are creating the Parthenon building in sort of the optical illusion so that when you look at the building, it looks perfectly straight, um, which your vision often does the opposite of. So when you see something that's straight, it often looks like it kind of bodes. Um, and so they kind of in trying to work against this to make it look like it's a perfectly straight building. They utilize entesis to create this optical illusion of straightness, um, which seems like mind blowing, right? That they would be actually able to do this. And it's this is a major part of what the documentary is about and kind of trying to break down this idea. Um, and they talk about sort of how they think the Greeks were able to do this and to create it in eight or nine years because it becomes sort of um, difficult for them to put the building back together, right? Um, and so they talk about when they go to the Temple of Apollo at Didyma, um, where they see this sort of um, drawing that they believe was utilized to kind of create the emphasis in each column that people would have been able to use and sort of understand, um, which would have helped people to kind of create them quickly and easily. And they also talked about the Salamis Stone, which has some sort of um, conversations about the modeling of the body and utilizing the body for measurement and going back to sort of Vitruvius and the ideal human body um, and kind of thinking about how the body is sort of a, a form of measurement. And so maybe this would have been utilized too um, as a way to create this sort of unify unifying system of measurement for the Parthenon. Um, and then there's this quote, man is the measure of all things. And of course, the Vitruvian man, which kind of comes from this idea as well. Now, the current state of the Parthenon is really important to where we'll be going sort of with our conversation when we come back from spring break, which is that um, you have this sort of destruction and restoration that's done very poorly of the Parthenon, but sort of how do we get to this point in the, the Parthenon being sort of very poorly restored? Why has it been sort of destroyed to the level that it has been? Um, and how is this conversation sort of important to the history of the Parthenon as a whole? So the Parthenon, so through sort of very many years of... Um, conquering the Greek state and controlling different structures and buildings. It's been a Christian church to the Virgin Mary. It's been a mosque. It's been um, a place for Turkish munition storage facility, an archaeological site, and then, of course, a major tourist attraction. So the biggest sort of destruction occurs during the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of what is sort of controversial about um, the Parthenon and the Elgin Marbles, which we're going to discuss, occurs during and because of the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottoman Empire takes over in 1460. And on um, September 26th of 1687, the Ottoman ammunition dump in the Parthenon, which um, is not a great place to put explosives, um, is lit on fire by the Venetians um, from Italy. And it completely sort of destroys the Parthenon and blows the roof completely off of it. Um, and destroyed a great number of its sculptures and objects. And so 
the Parthenon is left in sort of utter ruins at this point because of this. And um, at some point, uh, the Ottoman Empire builds a mosque in the ruins of the Parthenon. Um, and so this is kind of a artistic rendering of that. And you can see the Parthenon in sort of um, shambles. And during this time, around the um, early 1800s, only about half the decoration was still surviving. And so um, Lord Elgin, uh, who is Thomas Bruce, he's the seventh Lord of Elgin, um, gets permission from the Ottoman Empire, which remember is in control of the Greeks um, against their will, um, to remove sculptures that had fallen into ruin um, and to sort of purchase them and remove them from Greece. And... Um, there's sort of never been a document found about sort of what amount of money Thomas Bruce agreed to or sort of what the agreement was. There seems to be sort of some um, loss of this document, quote unquote loss. Um, and he takes them back um, and keeps them in his personal home um, in Britain and displays them. Um, and this is an image of that in sort of his display of these sculptures, which um, seems crazy. And what ends up happening, this is a cartoon kind of representing it, um, is that uh, Lord Elgin kind of goes into poverty, um, most likely because he tried to transport these massive sculptures into his home and just have like a museum there, um, and he needs to sell them. And so he kind of goes through this series um, of trying to kind of sell off the sculptures. And in 1817, he does that and sells them to the British Museum. Now, um, this becomes a sort of monumental moment for the British Museum. They are thrilled. They build this entire area to the um, sculptures, which is opened in 1832 um, and becomes this sort of powerful moment for the British Museum in sort of holding um, an insane amount of the Parthenon sculptures and uh, friezes and metopes, etc. However, um, by around 1832, the Greeks have received independence from the Ottoman Empire and um, are trying to get the marbles back from the British Museum, saying that they were removed against their sort of will um, in that they were not control of their own country at the time. And um, as you may or may not know, um, nothing has come of that, and I will talk about that shortly. Um, but... This is how they sort of look today in the current structure of the British Museum and how they're displayed the frieze. I believe this is mostly the frieze here um, with some of the sculptural systems in the back um, as well. And so we're going to talk about that and kind of this controversy because the British Museum has refused to return the um, sculptures themselves to um, the British Museum or the, I'm sorry, to the Greeks. The British Museum has refused to return them to the Greeks. Um, and even to the extent that, oh wow, these images are blurrier than I thought they were going to be. Um, the Acropolis Museum in Greece has been built for uh, these sculptures. I mean, how much money has the, have the Greeks put into rebuilding the Parthenon, into restructuring it, um, into making this massive museum, the Acropolis Museum, for these um, sculptures? And they have replicas um, instead of the actual sculptures. So uh, most of them being sort of uh, molds or what have you uh, that are displayed in this insanely gorgeous um, museum. And they do have bits and pieces of some of it, um, but... A good portion of it and sort of the, the sort of more valuable images, quote unquote, um, are still held at the British Museum. So I'm going to come back to that conversation in just a second. Um, I do want to sort of briefly mention that the Parthenon has kind of inspired a lot of different classically created architecture, such as um, the Second Bank of the United States, um, the National Portrait Gallery in London, um, as well as the Walhalla in Germany, U.S. Supreme Court building, 
the White House and the British Museum, which is supposed to look like the Parthenon as well. So your assignment for sort of over break um, slash sort of coming into um, the week of class uh, when we come back is to have this sort of Parthenon debate assignment, uh, which is up on the Moodle already, the prompt and sort of the general information, um, which is to kind of defend both sides of this argument. So um, on the one side to return the Algin marbles back to the Greeks, and the other is to keep it in the British Museum, where they have been for a while now. And um, in class on um, March 19th, we'll actually do an actual debate, so doing sort of half and half. Um, I'm already divided your groups up, but for the assignment, you're sort of defending both sides of um, the debate and then working through kind of the different arguments that are being made through these sources. So on the one side, you have the Acropolis Museum um, where they have sort of developed um, this massive system to house um, the Elgin marbles in particular, but um, have copies and replicas at this point. And so they have this sort of gorgeous museum that is set up to house these marbles that is not sort of housing them at this time, right? There's also a larger conversation about um, they didn't release them during um, ownership of their own country, and so the British Museum has sort of stolen these objects in some capacity. Um, and they do have some of the sculpture, but what's considered sort of quote-unquote not sort of the better sculpture or whatever the um, British Museum would like to say, because they sort of selected what works to steal. Well, not the British Museum, but um, Lord Elgin sort of chose the works that he liked the most um, and left sort of what he thought was not um, valuable behind. So I have separated you guys out into two groups so that when you come back from break, um, you will be separated into these groups to sort of argue um, and have a debate sort of on your side um, of the table. And I want you to think when we come back from break, so this is not something um, you have to do right this second or as part of this assignment, but it's just for you to think about um, who could be affected by keeping the Elgin marbles in London or returning them in to Greece. Um, what what are sort of the roles of different people who could be affected? So think, I've given kind of some ideas about curators, economists, lawyer, public relations, etc. So we're going to think about these roles and assign them um, when we do the debate, but um, you don't have to necessarily concern yourself with them right now, just to sort of think about them. So these are the two sides of the debate that I've already separated you guys out into, um, which is keep at the British Museum versus return to Greece. So you'll be arguing that sort of when we come back um, on Friday and you'll have time to sort of prep um, during the class period as well. Um, so have a great spring break. I will talk to you guys then and good luck. Let me know if you have questions.